Hi, everybody. Uh, we just uh, can see people are joining us now. It's just going to take a couple of minutes uh, just to let us uh, get everybody who wants to be here time to join. Um, we've had a bit of a seat of the pants experience this morning because Frances's um, computer went bang. Uh, so she's joining us on her mobile phone. Um, so hopefully that will that will keep going. It will keep up, but uh, it's going to be slightly more kind of um, rough and ready than maybe usual. But I'm sure it will be. I'm sure it will be fine. Uh, so let's let's make a start. We've got an hour. We're, we're still due to finish at 1.30 uh, and I'd like to keep to that. Uh, it's it's a great pleasure for me to to introduce Francis Crook, who is one of those people, certainly within criminal justice and indeed more widely, who really needs no introduction. So I will spare you that. If you want to know more about Francis beyond uh, what we talk about today then you can look her up on Wikipedia amongst other places. Uh, but one of the things I want to do today is just talk a little bit with Frances about her life before the Howard League um, as well as all the things that she's done in her very long and distinguished career as Chief Executive of, of the Howard League. Um, so we are recording this event, uh, we will uh, make the recording available as soon as possible after the event. Uh, we have the Q&A function so if you'd like to ask a question of Frances please do uh, put your questions in the Q&A function. If you like a question that's been asked, then, uh, then you can upvote it. And the more upvotes we get, the more likely it is uh, that it will be answered, um, um, it will be asked by me and answered by Francis. So without further ado, uh, Francis, uh, welcome. And thank you for making it through some <laughs> Slightly. <laughs> I, I am I'm such a technophobe. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm in the office and people have been helping, so I'm on my phone. It'll all be fine. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's what I, it's really great to have you here. It was uh, it was a little bit bit nervous as we were hoping to that the connection would work. So I'm glad. That yeah. We well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Okay. Well, I mean, I think you were kind of one of the when I I started in, in working in the criminal justice sector in the late 1990s, and I think you were one of the first mm. senior figures. Uh, that um, that had been already had a very strong, you know, very kind of um, impressive reputation then, and you've always been somebody that I've, I've greatly admired and um, have enjoyed working with over the years. So it's going to Thank be a bit of a <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a wrench, I think, for me and many people when you when you do finally uh, step down from your role uh, later in October. But we we have you for now, and that's great. And what I wanted to do was just start our conversation by just asking you to tell us a bit about, you know, life before the Howard League. So, you know, um, you can go back as far as you want, if you like, but I suppose, you know, your maybe your professional career before uh, your role in the Howard League and so on. So, yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, I started life as a secondary school teacher working in Liverpool and, um, and in London and doing supply teaching in special schools. So I taught many challenging young people uh, briefly. I then, was start, then went to Amnesty International um, where I was a campaigns organiser. So dealing with issues like the death penalty and torture and human rights abuses and um, prisoners around the world and prisoners of conscience around the world. Um, and did that for five years, which was a, a, a difficult time for Amnesty. Um, you may remember going back a few years, it was when um, they appointed Jeremy Thorpe as the head of Amnesty and we occupied the offices and we got rid of him and it was all very difficult. Um, but, uh, and dealing with very difficult issues, um, torture and, and meeting people who'd had the most appalling experiences, many prisoners of conscience who came to the UK. Um, and five years was enough. It was all I could cope with. It was it was uh, very traumatic and towards the end. Um, and uh, so then fortunately got the job at, at the Howard League um, uh, 35 years ago. But of course, I was terribly, terribly young when I took over at the Howard League. That's why 35 years is you know, a long time. So 35 years ago, I'm just trying to kind of um, do some yeah. maths. So that's about no, don't do any maths. <laughs> I'm still very young. <laughs> 1986 86, 86, 86 just 86 right. yeah, yeah right and so what was it I mean you've already indicated you you've obviously done quite a lot of work around imprisonment particularly in relation mm. to prisoners of conscience at amnesty uh so you know when you saw that job advertised um in Harry, is that how it happened or was it the tap on the shoulder 
No, it was a, it was an, an, an advert. I mean, I, prisons have always been been always been a fascination. My my father was a prison visitor in Brixton. He used to go and visit individual prisoners, and my both my parents were divorced, and my both married separately, alcoholics in a second marriage. And my mother's second husband ended up in Bedford Prison and hanged himself there. He was an alcoholic. Um, so it was all quite difficult. And I can remember my mother trailing across going to visit him in prison. Uh, so it's a sort of background, as it were. Um, and so when the job was advertised, it was it was what I wanted to do. And it's that's why I've stayed, because it's been the most incredible job dealing with the most important issues, I think, as a, a nation state has to deal with. Um, you know, justice, the relationship of the individual to the state, the power of the state over the individual, uh, keeping people safe um, is, is, uh, uh, is the most important issues you can deal with. So it's, it's been a privilege um, and, and a challenge. And you went into, did you go straight into the chief exec role? At yeah. Italy? Well, the, 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 I have to say there was me and Emily when I went straight into the chief executive role, there was there was me and Emily. I brought Emily with me from Amnesty because there was nobody. Um, we we had a, a turnover of about eighty thousand and an overdraft of fifteen, and we couldn't pay the pay photocopying bills. Um, the the organ uh, and I knew that when I took over, they were very honest with me. The organisation was in a terrible state. It, it had been around, you know, it's been around since eighteen sixty six and had never taken government money and relies on donations. Uh, from uh, trusts and from individuals and there was just no money at all and no staff so I brought um, a volunteer from Amnesty with me and we couldn't pay our salaries for the on and off for the first year or so we had just had to raise money and do stuff um, but it was and, and, and it was a risk but but when you're youngish you can you can take that risk and, and I so I spent a lot of time raising money and writing pamphlets, stuffing envelopes, and um, we, we did it in the first year. We were incredibly pr productive, I think. We held a big conference in, in Oxford. We published pamphlets. I, uh, my first week or so, I think I did 30 television and radio interviews. Um, it was, it was um, a baptism of fire, it really was. But, but you know, we've come on since then, and I, I leave an organisation now that is completely completely changed we own the building our tech may not be brilliant but then I think that's the case with a lot of people um, we own the building we, we've got money in the bank and I have t uh, 20 staff so things have changed a bit but it was it was touch and go to begin with and when you started so that was 1986 so uh, you know that would have been you know during the kind of the long period of, of conservative government. Mm. Margaret Thatcher would have you know, still mm. been the prime minister then. Mm. Was it, I'm trying to think who the Home Secretary would have, would it have been. I'm trying to remember too. It was just after Leo, David Waddington, I think. David Waddington. Um, and then Douglas Hurd. Um, I did a count. I've, I've had um, 17 secretaries of state and two of them twice. Um, Jack Straw and um, Ken Clark twice in different roles. Um, but uh, yeah, 17 of them. So I, it was the early stage. I mean, when I took over, the prison population was about 45,000, then it went up to 50, and then it went down to 40, um, just at the sort of the turn of the, the early 90s, um, prior to um, the, 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 the terrible killing, of course, of Jamie Baldwin, which made a massive difference. Uh, so it was, it was hovering around 40, 45,000 for most of the time. And we thought that was a lot. Well, you know, we were issuing press releases saying too many people in prison, um, but uh, things have got even worse. And had you, um, at the time that you were appointed, had you had you actually visited a prison? I mean, had you been inside a prison? Yes, I had. Yes, I had. Um, I'd been to Holloway Prison um, with the local councillor at the time, um, prior to, because I was a councillor. And uh, I went with the Islington councillor, who was a man called Jeremy Corbyn. I don't know if you remember him. Uh, so we went round halfway prison together. I'd also been to Barlini um, and met people in the special unit there, uh, and uh, which was the most extraordinary experience and still stays with me. I, I still remember 
every every minute of the visit there because the special it, the special unit was was one of the few times that that prison has been a success they'd had in scotland uh, terrible gang wars with killings and brutal beatings and people were tortured it was awful they, uh, and um so what they did with the, the gang leaders is they put them in cages in Inverness prison, literally in cages. And of course, it, it was the most awful thing to do to people. So they then did the opposite. They set up a special unit in Berlini, which was the, the main big prison in Glasgow, and let people do as they wanted and let them help run it. And it was an artistic centre of excellence. There was sculpture and painting. It was a creative centre. The special prison officers who weren't in uniform, but who were working with the prisoners, and it changed their lives. These were people that had been the most brutal, violent, nasty, aggressive people, some of whom I think had killed, and they turned their lives around. And they became great artists and they went on to um, make a living from from being creative uh, and it was it was the most extraordinary thing but has, has since closed some years ago sadly and the Barlini special unit because I mean I've I, I mean I've heard I've never, I never myself visited it but I've certainly heard others speaking mm -hmm. very highly of it from actually across a range of views from you know as it were very kind of um, you know conventional reformers as it were through to quite radical abolitionists who've mm. kind of talked about the Barlini special unit as an example of if you're going to have prison or mm. if prison with a particular kind of population um, mm. that's you know that's that's it's quite a good model as an idea how to yes. approach it. Yes. But, I mean when you so you when you joined the Howard League so mid-80s it was before the big upsurge in the prison population from the early 90s on, uh, you know, particularly associated, uh, you know, with Michael Howard as Home Secretary, and then of course with, with the Labour government as well. Mm -hmm. um, but what was the, um, you know, when you started back then, what would you have said, if you can indeed remember now, it's a long time ago, uh, what you've seen as kind of the main challenges facing the, the prison system at that point? Um, well, I think it was increasing numbers. I mean, but looking back on the Labour government, they, they poured money into prisons because the prisons had been really grotty. They were filthy. Uh, they, there was a lot of brutality there. There were scandals about people being beaten up in systematically in segs, in, in uh, woman scrubs, in Wandsworth. There were um, members of the far right or, uh, political parties. So there was rampant racism. So it was so bad that if you were black, you just didn't get any of the, the, the plum jobs or the, you know, the decent jobs and the kitchens or anything. Uh, and it, so things did change uh, when Labour came in. They, they put a lot of money into improving conditions. And of course, they were obsessed with courses and programmes and put a lot of programmes in, which we now know are of dubious value. But they also increased the number of people in prison. So they never built their way out of overcrowding, which is what they wanted to do. They wanted to, they kept saying, you know, we'll build new prisons. And this is starting to sound familiar. We keep repeating this. Um, we're doing, the government's doing it now. And, uh, but they didn't close the old ones. So they've just got more and more people in prison and the numbers of, of men, women and, and young people, children exploded under Labour. At the same time as they were, they were doing that, of course, they were also running the antisocial behaviour programmes. So that in Manchester, the capital of antisocial behaviour, they were issuing, the, the local authority was being encouraged by the Labour government, and it was the Labour authority, to uh, impose antisocial behaviour orders on children. They would uh, print leaflets showing the photographs of the children, and their ages and where they, the area they lived in and distribute the leaflets through people's letterboxes. Um, I mean, it's the most awful thing, awful things were going on under, under Labour and the antisocial behaviour. Um, and of course the orders were given to people who had mental health problems or who were drug addicted or who were prostituting themselves. And um, they were then caught up in the net and would end up in prison. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of sucking more and more people who, who were very often in need um, into a, a prison system that then got more and more bloated and um, got worse and worse. Mm. And I think we'll we'll come back to thinking about how things have changed over the, over the, you know, the period that you've been chief exec. Um, 
but just kind of going back a bit in time. So you'd been in post for about three or four years when the, the strange ways mm -hmm. protest, and indeed there were a number of mm -hmm. protests and riots across a number of prisons at that yeah. time. So, um, I mean, you kind of, you were still quite early in your career there, but I'm just wondering, I mean, I mean, you, you mentioned all the media interviews. I imagine you must have been very busy during that period, but how did you, mm -hmm. you know, Tell us a little bit about that whole period, which was a very kind of turbulent period within the prison um, system. Well, it was horrific and it was very frightening and I think very frightening for the families of, of the prisons who were on the roof and it was on the television every day. Um, and as you say, there were a, something like 20 other prisons. There were there were fires and riots and, and, and outbreaks of, of quite nasty violence as people were were very angry uh, at the way they were being treated. Um, and but I mean, out of out of the flames, literally out of the flames, of course, we had the Wolf Report, which made some very sensible recommendations. I and mean, he did some quite radical things at the time. He he asked the prisoners to tell him what what was wrong and what what he should do. Uh, he and he he gave them sort of envelopes that they could seal that wouldn't be read by staff, so they could contact him directly and confidentially. And what he recommended, I mean, the, the most revolutionary thing he recommended at the end was, was that prisons should not be very big, because Strangeways was huge, it still is huge, and that they should be no more than 250, perhaps 300 people, men, because they're communities, people live there, uh, they, they are, and people, as well as people working there, the people, it's, it's a home, it's where people live, and he was absolutely right, um, and uh, I know you want to come on to this, but you know we've, I've, I've been doing media stuff today on prisons that the, the government wants to build, which are 1,700 plus men, and that's the space they've got for them. Goodness only knows when they start getting overcrowded how big they'll be. And we know that big prisons like Strange Ways have, have inevitable problems. Nobody knows who everybody is. We don't know who um, the staff don't know who's going to be in the, the cell the next day. Um, the churn in strange ways at the time and still today is 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 horrendous um, it's they're not communities they're not homes they're not safe mm. and you mentioned the wolf report and uh, you know um, people have different views now i think looking back when it was certainly at that time as you said it was a very mm. significant report and there's been a lot of discussion over the years about if wolf had been implemented you know even in part never mind mm -hmm. the report um I mean, I just wondering, do you have, I mean, do you have some thoughts on kind of in a sense why Wolf was never implemented in the way certainly that, you know, Wolf himself had intended? And of course, we then had that lurch towards a much more punitive politics, which in many ways is associated with Michael Howard, but not alone. I mean, you know, there were a number of no. factors. There. Do you have a kind of, you know, the advantage of hindsight, you know, what, what changed in that period to maybe kind of, shift quite significantly on some of the politics well, issues. Well it's but it is politics and, and secretaries of state have enormous power. They can change things. If you look at what over the years what secretaries various secretaries of state have done, whether it was originally in the Home Office, more recently in the Ministry of Justice, they can change things. They can do stuff. They they not only create a tenor for the debate, you know, the mood and temper of the country, but they also make decisions about where you allocate things and they ask for money from the treasury and, and the decisions that were, were made and are being made are not about closing prisons, but it's always been about building more. Um, they always think they're going to build bigger and better, but they don't, they just build bigger and worse. And the decisions that were made by the people at the time, you know, they should be held accountable for it. They decided to build more and bigger prisons, not fewer um, and smaller prisons. That was the decision that was made and the people who made the decision uh, know who they are and I know who they are and you know who they are. <laughs> we all know who they are. I mean, this, seems, this seems like maybe a good time to um, bring in one of the questions we have coming in which is from Malcolm Fowler and he says speaking as a Labour supporter may I please ask what serious differences over prisons can be perceived between the government and even the Labour opposition, and certainly in the Blair years. So, you know, we have different governments, but I mean, I suppose Malcolm's 
kind of implying you know, there's not much difference in in views and policies around prisons. I mean, regardless of whether that's true now or not, and your thoughts on that, but has that been your experience over a number of years working in this field? Is it always part of there it? are there are differences? I'm not sure it's always to do with party politics. It's quite often to do with who it is that's in charge. Um, I mean, it, it, it's John Reed, for example, was very punitive. Um, he he. I, I was there when he had a real go at the parole board, saying you don't care about victims. Well, quite a few of the people in the room had been victims of crime, quite nasty crimes, and it was it was really offensive. Uh, he, so it's 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 not necessarily party politics. As I say, I think Labour did put lots of money into prisons, did improve physical conditions, did uh, recruit a lot more staff, but at the same time, the number of people went up. They were imprisoning their own people in a sense. You know, the, the people who go into prison are working class people. Less now than, than, than before, but it's certainly at the time in the 90s, the, it was working class, white to, to start with, and increasingly black, working class people who were being imprisoned, uh, often for poverty, because their mental health problems, their drug addiction problems, had they been middle class, would have been dealt with in different ways. But uh, working class, poor people with mental health, drug addiction or homelessness issues or marital breakdown, or all those sorts of things, which end up um, with a, a committing crimes, end up ended up in prison. And it was the antisocial behaviour, bonanza, which sucked masses, thousands, tens of thousands of people every year into prison who, who really didn't need to be there, who were... On the fringes who may have been their behavior may have been annoying but they were in need and their needs were not dealt with in prisons like like strange ways or, or anywhere else um but uh, and that's still true today we still imprison people like that go sit in any magistrate's court for a, a half a day and you you get transported back to the 1840s uh, and there's the same people and they end up in prison for the same sort of things I mean, the implication of that, I guess, is that you, you, you kind of seem to be, and forget, if I'm putting words in your mouth, forgive me, but you seem to be um, arguing that prisons really are a way of, kind of class-based way of managing certain problem populations rather than, you know, responding to crime or mm. keeping society safe. Well, we decide what's a crime. So we, we will imprison somebody who... who um, for example, that one of the, the things that, that's happened recently is the, the increase in the sentence for harming animals. Now, I, you know, I was vegetarian for a long time. I like animals. I don't want to hurt animals, but I've not seen any evidence that sending somebody to prison for five years instead of two years for animal cruelty is, is going to protect any cat or dog or cow. It's just not going to do it. Um, but we send people to prison for, for, for crimes like that, whereas um, companies who... Uh, manufacture and plastics that we all you know and stuff plastics on on stuff that we don't need it or that the polluters or um, other other you know corporate crimes like that we we put into uh, classic as you put them into the house of lords um but we don't imprison we don't criminalize it in exact in the same way so corporate crime is 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 not um an issue and and i think it's very interesting that the 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 tenor of the discussion by, by politicians constantly and it has it was yesterday and it has been consistently for years for decades is all about police on the streets and picking up annoyance on the streets whereas particularly now your your, your experience of crime is much more likely to be online um, but you don't hear that from politicians. It's always about the people on the streets. It's always about picking up people who are, yes, class-based, um, mental health problems. Um, but it's the people who we don't like, who are slightly annoying, but it's not actually the people who are doing us the most harm. And I think what you're, you know, you, you shared there, obviously, is, some, is quite a lot of sort of information that will be familiar to many people mm -hmm. who've worked in this debate. And it, it kind of um, it might be a good time to bring in one of the questions, another question. This is by Kay Wall. And um, 
she asks, how influential has your organisation and others been, and others been, not just Howard Lee, but I mean, obviously that's your experience, others been in engaging factual, informative discussion with the media and the general public in order that public opinion can be informed and indeed then start to influence government policy. So it's a kind of, in a sense, this whole theory of change wrapped up in, in that, you know, that a better informed public can influence politicians in order to influence more effective and humane policy. And uh, I mean, does that stack I'm up? Not, I'm, 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 I've never been terribly convinced by this. Maybe it's because I'm not at heart very democratic. I don't know, but I don't, I'm not convinced that you can, in, that small organizations with you know, 20 staff can first of all influence public opinion, whatever that may be, and whether public opinion actually in the end influences politicians. I think the influence on politicians is much more party-based. And if you really want to influence politicians, then you, you join a political party, any political party will do. There are several options available. Um, that's where things are actually decided. That's where power lies. Uh, in our in our system, particularly in the the voting system that we have in in this country, um, so I'm, I'm of course we we try and influence public opinion. We we hold events like this, don't we, Richard? We try to talk to people. We try and engage. We engage on social media. We hold. We issue pamphlets. We issue press releases. I will talk to anybody at any time. I will sit on any platform and talk to anyone. Um, but you know, you're you're, in, you're talking to a, a small group of people. There's some quite interesting work done uh, by uh, Shad Maruna, who uh, did a sort of pamphlet for us a few years ago, and he said basically there's a third of the population who will always disagree with you. There's a third of the population who will pretty much agree with you, and you try and influence the middle third. And so that's kind of the what I I've worked on. That I'm assuming there are quite a lot of people who agree with me. Maybe that's just. I, comforting myself here um, but there are people who kind of agree but don't really think about it that much and one of the ways that I've tried to engage with those people and, and a, a wider population is I think most of the general population don't give a damn about prisons they're not interested it's not going to affect them they don't know anyone's been to prison they don't really care they're not interested but they do know about police they, most people will know someone who's been arrested or had contact with the police. So that's why we've tried to engage more on policing at front end stuff, at stemming the flow into the criminal justice system. And increasingly over the last 10 years of work with police and engaged with the public and police. So we will praise the police for reducing child arrests. And when we first started issuing our 46 different press releases and doing a lot of local media, wow. local newspapers, and local radios, telling the police not to arrest children. I would get a lot of questions from local media, um, commercial and BBC, saying, well, you know, the children do something wrong. They, we've got to arrest them. Over 10 years, that has changed. I do not get that question anymore. I just don't get it from anyone. I get well, the, the, the Northumbria police is doing really well, but I see that you know, Cleveland's doing even better at reducing their child arrests. The debate has changed. And I think you can change, you have to figure out as an organ, a small organization, where you can have most bang for your bucks, most influence on the public opinion that will then influence behavior at a local level. So there's a little virtuous circle here of the police being pleased with themselves about not arresting children which has gone down, by the way, from a third of a million to 70,000, which is massive over 10 years. And or then engaging with the local public on local radio and local media. And, it, and that has made a difference. So uh, when we started doing this, there were three and a half thousand children in prison. And now there's 500. And there are, um, the, I'm sorry, they're drilling now. <laughs> oh, this is it's all, one know. of those days. It's I mean, you know, we're, we are talking about prisons, so maybe unwanted yeah. noise and claims. Is it, affecting the, is it affecting the quality? No, I think let's just keep going. It's, it's okay, fine. all right. Okay. Sorry about this, people. <laughs> I mean, that's, I think, you know, one of the implications of what you're saying there is that, 
you know, rather than, you know, kind of seeking to influence opinion in order to change policy and practice, yes. Yes. you kind of need to change practice, which also, which you can then use to feed back into helping people understand there's a different way of doing things. And yes. by doing so, it changes their opinion and ideas. Is that, is that too glib? Yes. Kind of no, but I think you've done it at a local level. I think our lesson was that you, you can't nationally, you can't issue a press release and it gets covered in the Guardian and maybe the Times, and you get a quote at the end of the article, you're not influencing public opinion that way. You may feel very pleased that you can take a cuttings because your, your, your organisation has been quoted, but you're not actually influencing opinion. If you do it at a local level and work with the key players, and in our case, we work with the police, and we used to be able to work with probation as well because they used to be independent, but now they're part of the civil service, you can't do that. And so, but the police are the are, are very influential locally, um, and you they they get into their local media, and they're very influential with magistrates, police and crime commissioners, um, voluntary organisations, all sorts of people. So, using them as a fulcrum for for uh, as a as a key for change, um, did has worked has worked quite dramatically. Because I think, you know, my experience of working in the in the justice sector is that sometimes mm -hmm. the campaigning organisations kind of, in a sense, situate themselves opposed to those practitioners within the system. So, I mean, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. probation officers are broadly seen as a good thing. Um, the police are treated with mistrust mm -hmm. and prison officers are, you know, for some considered the worst of the worst. <laughs> uh, now, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah. that's what I think, but I think that's often how it's, you know, portrayed. and judges are maybe, well, they're a bit out of touch, you know, they're a bit, you know, buffed and tough and type characters who maybe don't really understand the realities on the ground. But that's my true. sense from the implications of one of the things you're saying there is that, you know, if one's going to get meaningful change in the system, you've actually kind of, as it were, got to work with those people mm. rather than, uh, you know, kind of stide up, stand on the sidelines, just kind of throwing in bricks, as it were, metaphorically, hopefully, rather than yeah. literally, because they're the ones who potentially yeah. can make it. And absolutely, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I the, the police were changing when we started working with them because they, they again, under Labour, they had um, targets for arresting people, um, so they arrested lots of children, and that was uh, that, that was changing because they, the, the, the targets were, were abolished and the police were realising this was clogging up their custody suites and their time to, to no avail. And it was annoying people, it was annoying families, it was annoying victims and it was a, other things weren't getting done. So they wanted to change. You also at the same time had a, a, a more educated force going in, in, in the police. It's, it's pretty much graduate now. Um, and that makes a difference. It means that you've got, at the, particularly at the top, um, a, a group of, of chief constables who are who've mostly gone through the um, a master's degree in, in criminology at Cambridge or somewhere, and they 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 thought through the issues. Now I, I know a lot of things go wrong and the frontline policing and there's still a lot of racism and you know the stop and search and all of that, but actually we found when we were dealing with them we could get change. We achieved change through working with the police. And, and as you say, we you know, you used to be able to work with a probation service who were good guys. Prison officers, and well, prison governors you can work with, and, and they've got an independent, um, it's not a, a trade union, it's an independent um, organ association. Prison officers, go up and down. The POA goes up and down. I've worked with heads of the POA and with the POA when it's gone through a good phase and they've really tried to make a difference. I think it's going through a Neanderthal phase at, phase at the moment uh, where they just want to lock everybody up. I think it's very badly led and I think it's very damaging for, the, for prison officers and I think it's very damaging for prisons and it's very damaging for policy and it's very disappointing. Mm, okay. I think I've had some experience of POA, POA slightly differently from that to, to you on that regard but I, I take the point it is a kind of a challenge and it is a yes. very 
it's a very complex um you know union kind of uh you know working in a very difficult area but yeah, yeah. let's pick up a few more questions from some of our attendees so there's one here from um Dita Saliuka um about um what, what she refers to as unnatural deaths in prison uh, which, uh so she says what have the Howard League done as an organization to raise the issue of the high number of unnatural deaths in prison this has been increasing at a very high rate in the last five years. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, well, if, if going right back to the when the Howard League was founded in the 1860s, we, we, we worked very hard on, on um, deaths in, in custody, whether it started off being, uh, being executions and, and uh, went on to suicides. Um, I care very much about everybody who dies in prison. I have kept a record and I'm the, I think I've got the only record of everyone who's taken their own life in prison since, 80, uh, since, since I started um, 30 years ago. I've got their name and I'm going to give it to a library because I don't think you can, it, it'll be anywhere else. So I, I, it's a, it's, if you like, it's a memorial to everyone who's taken their life in prison in the last 35 years. Um, it says they're how they died, what they were in prison for. And so I, I take it very, very seriously indeed. It's very close to my heart, obviously for personal reasons too. Um, I, I, I take the point of Dieter saying about unnatural deaths. Of course, natural deaths are often unnatural too, in that lots of people die in prison from things that if they're in the community, they would not die from. They, they would be able to get um, treatment for. Um, so there are far too many people dying in prison from suicides, uh, from drug overdoses, um, they, and from, um, from what's called natural deaths. And I always put that in inverted commas because I don't think it is natural. Uh, too many, as I say, too many people dying altogether. We do a lot of work. Uh, we collate a lot of information. We publish information. I, t I try not to comment on individual cases because obviously sometimes the families find that quite distressing. So I'm sensitive to that, but we do a lot of sort of policy work on it. I helped to found, I was a founding member of the Ministerial Board on Preventing Deaths in Custody. And I've attended, or oh, somebody for, on, on our behalf has attended every meeting. I raise issues with ministers directly. I write to ministers. I talk to prisons. You know, we do what we can. It's an issue I feel very strongly about, obviously. It's, it's the most important thing. People should not be going to prison to die. It's as simple as that. And, you know, staying with that theme um, and the difference between, well, you know, what, when an, an unnatural death is actually a natural death or vice versa and the difficulties of that distinction. Uh, of course, one of the things that prisons have been wrestling with over the last couple of years um, is COVID. Um, mm. And uh, Wendy Sinclair Geben, who will be known to many, um, has a question about that, asking uh, whether you think that COVID has taken the cause of penal reform backwards. Mm. And, Maybe while you're thinking on addressing that point, maybe just a general assessment of, you know, where prisons are now in relation, uh, in a, as we're coming out of COVID or not in the case of prisons, and your mm. concern of how well the prison system did in handling COVID um, as well. But yeah, I mean, Wendy's question, I mean, has it caused a penal reform? Has it been made more difficult because of COVID? Has it been I made think it has. I mean, when, when we all went into lockdown, prisons went into lockdown, and we... We tried very hard, even threatened legal action to try and get the government to uh, release people early. So the people who were going to be released anyway, uh, but were, were, were coming to the end of their sentences and release them early to, to ease the pressure on the prisons. Because there were a lot of people who were locked up uh, alone all the time. And there were a lot of other people who were locked up two to a cell, which was designed for one person all the time. So. And, and, and I don't know which would have been worse. Um, in f they, di they didn't do that. Other, other countries did. Um, other countries uh, reduced their prison population. The, what happened was, because the courts weren't sitting, there was, a, there was a reduction in the prison population. But they're not coming out of the COVID restrictions. What they're doing is they're easing the, what they're calling the mitigations. So things like they're taking away the phones that people had got or the, and they're going to start, I think they're going to start charging for the video calls and things like that. Um, 
but people are still being locked up for excessively long periods. And even when they move to the top stage, stage one, or, um, from a uh, which allows more activity and that's still severely restricted when still not back to normal. Um, no prisons are and very few have moved to the, the highest stage. So there's still a lot of, uh, a lot of people, most people are locked up most of the time. And um, the problem with that is that the, the, the violence level well, by, by prisoners has gone down. Violence level by staff has not gone down. The use of restraint is the same as it was before, even though people are locked up all the time. The use of power has gone up. Uh, the use of segregation has gone, is, is still the same. Um, the uh, adjudications have gone down. So but it's still, it looks as though, because violence by prisoners has gone down, the prison, the POA, the Prison Officers Union, and ministers are talking about locking people up for most of the time now as the new normal. So it's going that's to be what's a going chance. To yes, I, 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 was, I was in a meeting um, a few mm. months ago with one of your colleagues uh, with some mm. of the senior prison service staff, mm. and they said it's absolutely not the plan to make this the new normal. But I think a number of us there were thinking, so, well, it's certainly what the POA is, the Prison Officers Association, the, the union is pressing for to make it the new normal. The, the minister that's just gone um, um, has, was talking about only allowing people out when they had something purposeful and useful to do. Well, lots of prisons haven't got anything purposeful for people to do. They just don't have the facilities. So unless you just let people mill around, they're going to be locked up all the time in their cells. So I, I, I think... I. I think lock, lock, lockdown, a version of lockdown, will be the, the new normal in prisons, yeah. So is that, I mean, looking forward, is that the, um, the main challenge facing prison reformers and the broader prison reform agenda to challenge that and try to kind of establish, you know, a better future for prisons? <laughs> Well, it's, I, I think there are three things. One is the prison building programme, which is, is a, appalling. Um, the other is what happens in prisons, and the other is the number of people going into prisons. Um, and, and they're all interlinked. Um, they, the, the, the government is, assess, is uh, assuming there's going to be something like 100,000 prisoners over the in the next few years. And they're building more prisons to accommodate them. But that won't build out of overcrowding and they're not going to close the old prisons. So we will still have places like Chelmsford, which has, was put under an, an urgent notification and, and is, is, is absolutely dreadful. Um, and we will still have all the other Victorian prisons and we will still have overcrowding, but we'll just have new big prisons. So we've got too many people going into prison, too many prisons and awful things happening inside them. Um, and the, the trouble is that by expanding the system, you make the problems worse, not better. You don't solve problems. They're not solving the problems at all. They're just making them bigger and more expensive. And some years ago, the Howard League hosted the International Conference on Penal Abolition uh, mm. in London. So is that, in your mind, is that the sort of the, the, a, the end to aim for, you know, the actual abolition of prison? Um, or is it a kind of more of a question of, you know, just, I don't know, reform, improving the current system and accepting that there'll be some people who will always be in prison? I, mean, I think that's so far away from where we're at. I mean, I, I think it's very important sometimes to talk about what you what you should be aiming for, what 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 justice could look like. And I think it's very important for organisations like CCJS and Howard League and, and others to talk about what it could look like so that people can visualize it they can imagine it what it could look like but it's so far away from from where we are that i think it's it's just not going to happen um and it's it's a difficult one because there are that there are people who have mostly men i have to say who have committed really really nasty crimes sometimes several times and who are really, really dangerous. So whilst I, I would, my vision is to abolish prisons as they are, I do think there are people who, at least for a transition period, you know, if, if you've tortured somebody really badly and then killed them and maybe done it to several people, I, you know, I, I don't want to sit next to you on the tube. 
quite honestly, I don't want my daughter to sit next to you on the tube. So I would abolish prisons as they are, but I still think there has to be some way of coping with people, maybe who are so damaged and for maybe understandable reasons, but they have done horrendous things and they are dangerous. So that's why the Balini Special Unit or Grendon or di different things like that, a different sort of completely different environments ca can work for the very few people, almost entirely men, who, um, who, who require some custody. But it's, uh, so we have to talk about that. We have to talk about what that would look like, for whom and how many, but it's a, it's a long way from where we are. Let me just picking up on a couple of points you made earlier about antisocial behaviour and also police mm. arrests of young of children, mm. and so it kind of in a sense as you, as you pointed out with with the youth imprisonment, you know we've gone roughly speaking over a decade from about three thousand plus to around five hundred, mm. um, you know which I'm pretty sure you know ten years ago if someone had offered you or me that as a kind of a situation we'd be in, we think yeah thank you very much we'll take that. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously women's imprisonment is slightly different, but you also mentioned, you know, the expansion of the population part because of the ASB agenda. So it seems to me that one of the things that one could draw from what you're saying is that the cause of radical reform, decarceration and abolition is in some ways quite a sort of a, a set of mundane practical tasks. Mm -hmm. You know about policing practice. It's not, yeah, I like that. It's not a kind of a highfalutin sort of airy fairy you know, utopian dream. I mean, that actually is something that could be worked through in quite concrete ways. I don't know whether... No, I absolutely agree with that. I think it can be. I think it can be achievement, which is why we concentrated at the at, with the policing side to to, um, to reduce the number of children in, in prison. I'm still 500 is far too many. About half of them are on remand. Most of those young people will not get a prison sentence. Most of the children will not. Most of them are black. Uh, so the racism in the system is something we have to confront. Um, so we could uh, we could get the number of children in prison right down to 50, 60, certainly under, under 100. We could do the same with women, um, absolutely. And of course, we could get the number of men right down. Um, I, I, I hope that the work we're doing and have done with the police at reducing arrests will work its way through the system slowly so that Fewer children being arrested will mean that fewer young adults are arrested and are not going to go through the system. So th the numbers of those in, in custody at the, at the sort of deep end will reduce. Um, the problem is that the sentencing now is, is so inflated that, that people who used to, when I first started, get a life sentence of 12 years are now getting a life sentence of 30. So we're putting people in prison um, and we're keeping them there for incredibly long periods of time without hope probably of ever being released. It may not be a whole life tariff, but if you're put into prison for 30 years at 20, the chances of you coming out alive, you know, it's, it's debatable because you, it, the prison environment is so awful and so unhealthy. Um, it's, it's, it's very depressing. All right, let's pick, on a, pick up on a couple more questions that have come in. Um, one which I think um, relating to organisations, the organisations like the Howard League work with. So one from the British Society of Criminology. How do you see the role of academics in supporting organisations <laughs> such as the Howard League and or influencing public opinion? And then maybe, um, you know, possibly putting you on the spot a bit, I don't know, an anonymous attendee is asking, what is your view on the state of the voluntary sector working in the criminal justice system? So, first of all, academics, both their role in working with organisations like Howard League and more broadly influencing public opinion. And then what do you, what do you have? At the how risk of being facetious, of yeah, at the risk of being facetious, some of my best friends are academics. Um, I think academic criminology has not been great recently in this country, I have to say. Um, there are some fantastic people doing it, but it's, it's my God, it's slow um, and hedged around with so many caveats. I would like to see academics and research at the forefront because I think evidence is, is really, really important and we haven't had enough of it. So I would like to um, put um, academics much more at the forefront. I'd like to see them much more at the debate. I think there's, there's sometimes a 
too much caution on their part. But I, th- but I think that's it's it's really important. And some some academics have been absolutely bloody brilliant, I have to say. Um, and and for the voluntary sector too. Um, actually, there's a very lively voluntary sector, a very challenging voluntary sector. I think it's it's small. Um, Prison Reform Trust, Howard League, CCJS, Women in Prison. You know, that we're we're the sort of broadly the independent sector, but we're quite small. Um, and um, that's you know that's and that's an issue. But I think we we are disproportionately influential, despite the fact that a, a turnover of probably less than a million with between ten and twenty staff, we can we can all be quite influential uh, compared to other sectors. And you know, if you look at other sectors like health or education, that that the um, the, the, the the voluntary sector there tends to be massive. And we're quite small, but we're still quite quite influential, and we have great access. You know, I'm looking at my emails. I'm getting let, letters from the um, minister and um, the inspectorate today, so I'm getting responses to, to letters we've written, which is nice. They don't always say what I want them to say, but at least they're responding. <laughs> yeah. And that accountability is really important because we publish things. Everything we say and everything we do, we publish. And so I think that accountability of politicians is really important and accountability of voluntary organisations too is very important. So we, we do our best. And do you sense, I mean, the, you know, the voluntary sector, the campaigning sector, I mean, do you think it's sort of more vibrant now than when you first started, more, mm. more influential now than yes. when you first started? Yes, I think so, because it, it, looking back um, at the, the records of the, of the Howard League, for example, when we were pretty much the only organisation in the 30s, 20s and 30s, uh, we, we walked the corridors of power and we had great influence. But the, the, the diversity of, of voices now in the voluntary sector, I think, is really important, is, is very energising, um, intellectually energising and shows the, um, and widens the evidence base and the research base. And so I think that's really, that's really important. So yes, I think there's a lot of energy around and that's, that's, that's great, uh, really encouraging. Okay, another question, I mean, maybe not quite answer this, but I don't know, so are you still recovering from Secretary of State Grayling? Um, <laughs> maybe kind of putting it kind of slightly um, less sharply than that, I mean, by all means answer it in that way, if you like, is, uh, I mean, you've worked with a number of Home Secretaries and Justice Secretaries. Um, who have you most liked working with and maybe who have you least liked working with? And what would, we've got a new Justice Secretary who's just starting, what would be your advice mm. to him? Well, funny enough, uh, um, and I have to, you know, hold my hand up and admit this, I, I on and off, not consistently, but on and off, a, a, a Labour member and that's on record because I was a Labour councillor but actually the, the Justice Secretaries I think I've, I've worked with who I've got on best with and who I've had more time for have been Conservative um, and that's Michael Gove, Liz Trust, David Waddington. Um, David Waddington didn't get any of the credit for the 91-92 reforms but actually they came from him rather than Douglas Hurd who took all the credit. Um, so you know, there's some. It's not the party that 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 affects people. Jack Straw in his first term was very good. He brought in Freedom of Information, the Human Rights Act. Second term, not so good. <laughs> so um, it, it 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 depends um, who pe- who people are, uh, rather than that. I, I I refer to Michael Gove because he talked about people in prison in a very positive way. And that's unusual. He talked about redemption. He talked about giving people a second chance. And I think that's incredibly important. And that's probably the most important thing. You can, you can have reforms, but the, the way you talk about people matters hugely. And um, I like a respectful debate with individuals. That was very challenging with Chris Grayling. And perhaps we weren't as respectful as perhaps we ought to have been. We did tend to ridicule him, but he was an easy target. He did you know, put himself up to it. Um, but so, but I, I think a respectful and debate is important. Dominic Raab, I don't know what he's going to be like. We'll wait and see. I'm worried by his obsession with abolition of human rights. That's very worrying indeed. Um, but we'll wait and see. Oh, give, 
give, give, give them a chance. I'll give them a chance. OK, thank you. Um, now, the most popular question um, on, on, on our Q&A is from anonymous attendee. Um, and they ask, what do you see as your greatest achievements and your greatest regrets in your time at the Howard League? Greatest achievement is the reduction in child arrests and children in custody, which I, I'm immensely proud of because, because tens of tens of thousands of children have not been arrested. And we were the only voluntary organisation working with the police on child arrests over the 10 or 12 years. And I know we contributed to that. And that's, that is, is fantastic because it means that the children didn't get their life blighted um, as an arrest can be and didn't get sucked into the, the criminal justice system and um, their families were, weren't engaged in it. So the, the, sometimes not doing something is more important than doing it. So getting the police not to arrest was, was it took a little while for them to get their heads around it. And they kept saying, what do we do instead? And I kept saying, nothing. Leave it up to parents, leave it up to schools, everybody else. Goes, it's not your job, leave them. Um, and, but they got it eventually. It was quite hard. Um, greatest regret is the number of people in prison and the, the awful conditions and the, the outcomes. I mean, just prisons are just so awful. Um, and that's we, we haven't, haven't made headway, headway there and haven't made headway with that argument. And it's very depressing because every day somebody dies in prison and um, I get their names. I get the names of everybody who's in prison who dies and we get notifications within days of of every everybody who dies and i don't talk about the other thing i don't talk about deaths in prison these are people who are dying um so that's my greatest regret mm. okay. that's to my success to do with <laughs> um i mean just a quick final question uh, i mean I think it's clear from your career that you you became the chief exec of Howard League quite early uh, in your career. As it I was, was terribly uh, young. You know, <laughs> and had a you know, huge impact on the organisation. So, you know, which is quite intimidating for anybody wanting to get into uh, you know, the criminal justice sector and, you know, work in, in the kind of areas of campaigning and reform. Um, but, you know, do you, what would be your advice for, you know, for students and young people who feel strongly and passionately about this area and want to get involved and maybe, you know, head up, ultimately head up an organisation like the Howard League? What would be your advice to them? Go for it. Absolutely go for it. These are really important issues and there are fabulous people working on them. Um, my, my, my staff team here are just amazing. They're incredible people who work so hard and who care so much and are so skilled and so able. Um, and I know that's true in, in all the other voluntary organisations working across the, across the field. These issues are critically important. If we can't get justice right, we can't get anything right. It is the foundation of what a good state should be getting the justice system right so it's absolutely important you come into it you do what you can and you devote your whole life to it um, and you won't regret it i can't hear you that's no, sorry thank you that's it's been an absolute delight uh, talking to you francis well uh, thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs> And for those who would like to hear more from Francis, uh, we, we're, the centre is, is organising an event mm. with Women's Place um, mm. in central London. It'll be in real life as well in central mm. London. Uh, people, 27th people. of October and Francis is, is going to be one of our speakers at that event. So if you want to know more about that event, then there's more information on our website. But for now, Francis, it's been lovely to catch up with you. Thank you. And, um, and thank you for all that you've done over the years. You've well, thank you. Many of us. It's been a great pleasure working with you, Richard. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>